Welcome, everyone. Welcome to the Chrome Dev Summit. We're so, I'm so excited to be here. Very happy to be able to share our enthusiasm, all the excitement about the uh, web ecosystem with you and talk across these two days about all the things we're doing to help you be successful building for the web, about all the things we're doing in Chrome. Very excited. So let's get into it. So our mission on Chrome, our mission is to move the web platform forward. This is as true today as it was when we first got started with Chrome nearly 10 years ago. And so we're very excited about that. Um, like I said, over the next two days, we're going to have a lot of content for you, a lot of great stuff talking about how we're working to try to make the web better and work with you to great, create great experiences on the web. Now, ordinarily, at the beginning of these talks, we usually update you on the number of Chrome users. In fact, last time at Google I.O., we mentioned that there was over a million Chrome mobile users, which is just awesome. And there's been tremendous growth. Uh, but this year, I want to present a slightly different number. Uh, this year, I want to share, or sorry, not this year, it was the same year, but uh, at this moment, I want to share that we have over 2 billion active Chrome browsers. This is across mobile and desktop. So rather than focus on uh, one platform, I wanted to make this point that there are just a lot of Chrome browsers out there. And while that's great for us and everything, and I, don't, I don't mean for you to be excited about that. I think what's exciting about this to you all is that when you're thinking about building for the web, this means there's a lot of browsers out there that implement the latest web standards and implement all the latest and greatest features that when we're talking about how to build for the web, how to take advantage of these new things. That's reality. You can actually take advantage of that. There's a lot of users out there with modern browsers. And it's not just Chrome. There's lots of other browsers that are implementing the latest standards, too. There's a lot of energy and excitement in this whole space, which is really, really great to see. I think it's fantastic. And so it all gets to the point that the web has tremendous reach. And we know this. This is, this is why it's such an attractive platform. It's such a cost-effective, low friction way to get experiences in front of users, get in front of real people. And that low friction is, is all made possible because of links, URLs. That's the, that's the superpower of the web, right? We're, we're very used to that. And the links are getting even more exciting. So I wanted to invite you to um, pull out your phone. If you have an Android phone or if you have Chrome on your iPhone, um, there's beacons in this room, Bluetooth beacons. So make sure you have Bluetooth turned on. And if you're on an iPhone, you don't have Chrome set up, right? You can check this URL here. It'll give you instructions. But the point is, the physical web made possible because of Bluetooth beacons and, and the, your Android device observing those beacons and sending URLs out into this room, URLs that are contextually interesting to you. So in this case, there's a beacon broadcasting the URL for the Chrome Dev Summit web app. Web app. So it makes it very convenient. This is sort of leaning on the power of, the, of URLs. As a user, you can just quickly go under the notification shade on Android, click, click on the uh, physical web entries there, find yourself on an experience. There's not much hassle to that. It's really great. Now, there's another beacon in the room for an app called Polymon, a web app called Polymon. This was created by the Polymer Project, Polymer team. So Polymon is a um, free-to-play, location-based, augmented reality game. It uses your mobile device's GPS capability to locate, capture, battle, and train virtual creatures called Polymon. <laughs> that sounds kind of familiar, right? Anyways, um, so you collect Polymon by locating members of the Polymer team in the real world in this conference venue. Uh, so check it out. It's really cool. It's a lot of fun. So like I said, uh, contrast that seamlessness, that ease of, of finding yourself on experiences thanks to the web with the cost of installing its software. That friction really matters. So by some estimates, every interaction step that you expect a user to take in order to get to your experience can cost you up to 20% of your potential users. Think about that for a, no, a, a, a moment. Compare like one tap to, say, three taps. That means you're potentially losing about a third of your users. Or, or imagine four taps versus one tap. Now you're potentially losing half your users, roughly. And so that's, that's a big deal, right? We all know this. That's why we're all here. We're excited about the web. We know this potential. It's, it's real. It's, it's awesome. And so the web, the web is really great on mobile. Uh, we've been very focused on the mobile web for some time. And of course, the web didn't grow up with, the, with mobile being a reality. But the web has been awesome for uh, the mobile has been awesome for the web. And it has really helped expand the whole market for the web, make it, make it, making it so much more easy to reach users. Think about it. You have a mobile phone in your pocket. 
Uh, the fact that you can sit on your couch and not have to get up off the couch to grab the laptop, but you can just pull out the phone, browse the web, access all this wealth of information, shop for things, et cetera. It's so convenient. I just recently, I, 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 I pulled out my phone, my Nexus phone, and I bought a Pixel phone. <laughs> it was so easy. Um, <laughs> of course, now there, there's a delay, probably, but anyways. Uh, anyhow, uh, of course, we know that the web has lots of challenges. It wasn't, again, built with all of that in mind, with a mobile in mind. And all these challenges, these constraints, have, have led to an innovation, really. And we've all had, as a community, had to figure out mobile, and we've done, made a lot of progress. So there's going to be a lot talking about that. And of course, the mobile web has evolved a lot from the early days. And this, this uh, chart is just a reminder. I think most folks are familiar with this, that mobile web usage has, what is that? Anyways, uh, mobile web usage has far eclipsed desktop web usage. This is you know, going back a couple years. And so I, I'm sure many web developers are familiar with this, and it means building for mobile web is a priority. And mobile web brings with it so many challenges, of course. Mobile devices are vast and varied, different screen sizes, CPU constraints, memory constraints, power constraints, all manner of constraints, and of course, connectivity constraints. We're all familiar with the good old offline dinosaur, right? Um, and of course, connectivity constraints are not just about reliability, they're also about bandwidth and latency, and some of these challenges are extremely acute for a lot of your users because 2G networks are a reality for many people in the world. And if you look at developing markets, it's even more of an issue. Nearly two-thirds of users in developing markets are, are, are stuck behind 2G connections. That's a big deal. Infrastructure is improving, but we don't expect this to, 2G to go away anytime soon. It'll still be with us. So there's a lot of challenges there to address 2G. And the web itself, you know, the whole point here is that the web is a very big thing. It's worldwide. It's in the name. It's, it's everywhere. It, it's it's an, a wonderful tool for so many users. There's easily three point, over 3 billion users across the whole world using the internet. That's like 10 times the size of the US. So if you think about it, there's just a large addressable population. And then nearly 2 billion of those are in developing countries. So we look at current estimates of internet users. We see that well, there's roughly about 280 million in the US, about double that in India, about 460, and in China, upwards of 720 million. So the web is truly global. It's a, there's, a, there's a lot of users all over the place. And if you look at just the growth last year, a lot of it's concentrated in places like India, where India saw about 30% growth, over 100 million new users coming online. That's really remarkable. That's 10x the growth of China, 100 times the growth in the rest of the world. And emerging markets is where a lot of the new growth is going to come from as well. Just focusing on India, for example, 65% of that population of that country is not yet online. That's 860 million potential new users. 20 times the number of users not yet online in the US. And so I think, actually, the reason why I make a, a focal point of India is not just that there's a lot of users there, uh, but actually that we're seeing some of the most interesting and, and, and remarkable web development happening in India. And the reason for that is because a lot of these users who are connecting to the internet for the first time are doing so, you know, not from a laptop, they're doing it from a phone, a phone that is very underwhelming by what uh, many of us are used to. These are phones with 512 megabytes RAM at most, uh, very limited screen sizes, very underwhelming CPUs, limited memory, uh, I already mentioned memory, <laughs> limited storage, right? A lot of these users, they don't have a PC where they're going and backing up their data. That phone, that phone, there's the computing device. That's where they're storing information that they care about. It's not easy for them to install another app. In fact, it's very common. You talk to people, they say, I went and installed an app, used it for a little bit, and then uninstalled it so I could have that precious, precious storage space for something else. So we're seeing a lot of innovation in this area because it turns out the web is actually a fantastic tool. Think about it. The web is designed, it's a streaming platform. You can bring part of your experience down incrementally. It's designed for constrained storage. It's great for constrained networks, actually. And with, thanks to a lot of the new APIs that have been going into the platform, we're enabling developers to have a lot more control over how their web experience works, how they can deliver the experience, and how they can uh, you know, create a good experience for users. And we're going to talk a lot more about that. So there's just a lot of innovation happening here 
out of the need to address those constraints. And it's really that necessity that is, is leading to so much in innovation. And I think it's really exciting. Uh, and so my point really is that web apps work really well in emerging markets. They also work really well here. And all the approaches, techniques, and technologies that have been developed that work, are working for folks in India, they work really well here too. I think we all know what it's like to have poor connectivity. But we also know what it's like to have LTE. So this is, this is the point. Web works really well in emerging markets. A year or so ago, we had early pioneers in this space, like Flipkart, showing the way, developing lightweight web experiences that could incrementally come down onto the device, be cached, and, and deliver delightful experiences to users behind 2G connections. Other companies have been em embracing this approach as well. One that I want to highlight is, is Voot Media, a Voot uh, streaming, video streaming service. Uh, this comes from Viacom 18, which is a joint venture between Viacom and Network 18. Uh, so they just set up um, a they just, this, is a, this is a new service, and they got online very recently. They built a web experience. In fact, 40% of their traffic goes through the web. And they, by building for the web, they were able to really reach a lot more users more easily. And in fact, just getting started here, they, it took them only a matter of like three weeks to prototype an experience that they were happy with and that convinced them that they should continue to invest. And they are investing further. They're, the next version will feature um, offline caching of snippets of videos so that users can preview movies and TV shows and other Voot originals easily. So that's very exciting. So this is all about building progressive web apps. I think many of you have all heard this term before. We've been talking about it for a while. We introduced it last year. And progressive web apps are not just about any one technology or any set of technologies. It's not even about you know, uh, anything like that. It's more about a new way of thinking about building web experiences web experiences that are radically improving the user experience. And we're going to be talking a lot about this. But these experiences that you can create, the thing that I want to show you and have you leave with is knowing that you can create experiences that are just as immersive, just as engaging, just as native feeling as any experience you expect to find on your phone. I think that's really exciting, the, combining the power of the web with sort of the form factor of mobile and creating experiences that really delight users and that you get a lot of value out of. And so there's a lot of different companies joining in and seeing success. And we're going to be talking about a variety of these over the course of these two days. But I'd like to just zero in on one and uh, take a moment to show you a demo. So this is about CNET. CNET has built an experience at cnet.com slash tech today. It's a progressive web app. And so let me demo that for you. So I'm going to switch over to the overhead here. So I have my schnazzy new Pixel phone. And I have CNET Tech Today added to my home screen. So I'm going to launch it. And it comes up smoothly. Nice little transition there. Smooth scrolling, of course. This is a little carousel, so I can browse different articles. Oh, try not to read the news too much. <laughs> um, so anyways, you saw that was all very smooth, fluid, fast, as what you'd expect on a mobile device. You might, have, might notice that I'm on airplane mode. That's pretty cool, right? Maybe you thought I already had Chrome running or something like that. So I'm going to just uh, let's get rid of that. And uh, let's do it again. Same thing you saw before. It's pretty cool, right? <laughs> oh. oh, just in case you didn't have, you had any doubts, that was just a website. I added it to my home screen. Anyways, <laughs> thank you. Let's go back to the slides. Um, so really great to see uh, the work that folks like CNET are doing, but they're definitely not alone. Excuse me. Another um, partner that we want to talk about is Alibaba. And Alibaba is, one of the, is the world's largest business-to-business -business platform in over 200 countries. So they built a progressive web app over the summer. And they're seeing 76% increase in conversions. And this is about users uh, uh, interacting with uh, support when they're interested in a product. So it's very exciting. That's a huge uh, key metric for them. And seeing that kind of increase is, is significant. And I, and I want to I wanna just um, make the point real for you. So like, Singles Day is an event that Alibaba uh, sees is an event in China a day where lots of, lots of um, 
shopping happens. This is an event where people feel encouraged to buy something for themselves. And the Singles Day happens on November 11th, 11-11, which, if you adjust for time zones, is right now. And uh, this is the biggest shopping event on the internet. And they expect to see nearly 20 billion in revenue, which is three times more than Black Friday and Cyber Monday combined. So investing in the progressive web app was a big deal for them, a, a, a significant thing. And seeing these kind of conversion rates is a big deal. So I think it's great to see uh, folks having this kind of success building for the web, building for the mobile web. And Taltran will be up shortly after me uh, to share more partner stories with you. So progressive web apps, uh, we've talked about this before, like I said, and we've been defining them as reliable, fast, and engaging. The point is progressive web apps are about creating a much better user experience. Like what, I saw, well, like what I showed you with the CNET Tech Today example. And by reliable, I mean things like, well, you saw how I was offline and I tapped a home screen icon. The experience should work, right? That's what a user expects. That's the point. And when, it talks about, when you think about fast, this is a great stat. It comes from a double-click study where they found that users abandoned, 53% of users abandoned sites that take longer than three seconds to load. Interesting thing about this is that a year ago, that number would have been 40%. So users obviously don't have the patience that, that you might wish they had. And so it's really important to pay attention to that initial loading experience. And you saw with the CNET example that it was very nice. And so all this is made possible thanks to the Service Worker API. <laughs> we, it's, but it's not just the Service Worker API, it's about using it properly, and we're going to talk a lot about that. Um, but the Service Worker API, just to refresh you, is, a, is an API that lets you have control over your caching strategy and offline approach to building your experience. So you can manage how the network is used by your web, web app. And that is really the, a huge enabler for the web platform. And we estimate about 3 to 4% of all page loads in Chrome are now going through Service Workers, which is really cool. So focusing in on for performance. This is another, uh, another way of looking at it, and I, I really like this quote. It comes from a member of our team. If you wouldn't make eye contact with a stranger for the time it takes you, takes your web app to first paint, it's too slow. So there's, this is getting at that sort of awkwardness of like, well, I'm waiting, I'm waiting, what's happening? And first paint, that's about getting some pixels on the screen, drawing something, right? Uh, there's no reason why that can't be done quickly. There's lots of challenges, of course, but we want to show you how to be successful at that. And it's not just about getting some pixels on the screen, it's also about making that experience interactive shortly thereafter. And so with that in mind, you're going to hear us talk a lot about this metric, getting your site interactive within five seconds over a 3G connection. Again, not everyone is uh, you know, lucky enough to have an LTE connection, so focusing on 3G seems to make sense. And, and if you have an LTE connection, you should be able to do a lot better than this. But five seconds is, is, a, is a great metric to, that we're going to talk a lot about. And this is made possible thanks to things like Service Worker, but that sort of leads to designing your web application better, chunking it up better. But there's other technologies like HTTP 2.0, which are a big enabler here. And um, oh, by the way, uh, Service Worker API requires TLS, and HTTP 2 give, brings TLS. So these things all work together very nicely. We're very excited about these technologies and, and helping you achieve these kinds of goals and build fast experiences for the web. So when it comes to engaging, um, you saw how I had a website on my home screen. It was an engaging experience. Normally, what you expect from the mobile web, well, you expect that it's easy for users to land on your site. It's so, so easy, thanks to the power of URLs, for users to discover content. But what about getting back to that content that they liked? Well, oftentimes, that means a user might have to like, remember to think to bookmark your site, or remember the origin, or remember all the steps that got them there. And of course, when it comes to mobile, that's nowhere near as effective as just getting your icon on the home screen. So a year ago, we focused on this problem, and we introduced app manifests and an ability for the website to indicate that it would be great to prompt the user to get them to add the site to the home screen. And this has been a, you know, a great, a great uh, feature. Uh, it, you should think about add to home screen as sort of like a lightweight install. That's kind of the experience that I showed you there. And on Chrome, or sorry, we've seen from partners a lot of great success from Add to Home Screen. This stat comes from Alibaba, which I was talking about earlier. 
they've seen four times more uh, engagement with Alibaba thanks to Add to Home Screen for, for users who have added Alibaba to their home screen. So that, that makes sense. It's not actually surprising. It's good to see it, it borne out like this. So Add to Home Screen is an important thing. We know that intuitively. And indeed, it is based on the data we're seeing. We've also been tuning Add to Home Screen. So we've been playing with the heuristics. One of the things we didn't want to do was just spam these prompts in front of any user any time. We want to be thoughtful about it. So we've been tuning them and seeing by tuning them, by reducing the amount of engagement required on the site before we show the prompt, they're actually getting 48% more conversions or installs or users adding these sites to their home screen, which is a really great stat. And it all without actually increasing the number of users who ignore the prompt or dismiss the prompt. So we feel like there's a lot of opportunity here to continue refining. And so I just want you to know from, Chrome, from the Chrome team perspective, we're working to tune this and make it work even better. We're also playing around with different formats. Why not call it install, actually? Uh, and so we're, we're definitely experimenting with that. Uh, I think there's some interesting questions here, but it's uh, exciting to try. And I'm really excited to share that we're also looking at uh, experimenting with deeper integration into the Android OS. And this is, this is really cool. So today, the way Add to Home Screen works is it's putting a widget on your Android device. And what that means is the user, if they remove that, they're not going to find the app, the, the, the icon in the all apps, and that can be confusing. So we're working to improve that so that when you go through the add to home stream flow, what it actually will mean is that your website will actually be available in all apps. It'll be in places where you expect to find app icons on the device. This has been a big effort. There's a lot of work still to do. Uh, we're experimenting with this. Um, it's going to be in preview shortly on the Chrome Dev channel. So we're very, very excited about this change. Um, and some of the other things that go along with it are things like giving you the ability to update the icon and change the name of, your, of the thing that's been pinned to the home screen, which is a really obvious thing that you should be able to do. And then also, we're experimenting with granting notification permission when the user goes through the Add to Home Screen flow. Uh, that's, something you also, that's, not, that's something that a user actually is used to when they think about the way Android permissions work. So we're just looking to like, smooth out the rough edges here, make the experience work a lot better. I'm very excited to share that. And Paul Kinlan will be up here a little bit later talking more about, how, uh, about this change. So the other, other big way that, that um, the, the developers like to re-engage with users on phones is with push notifications. This is something that we've been working on for a while, been seeing a lot of adoption. Uh, it's, very, it's, it's a really key feature, think about it. Uh, users who are interested in getting notifications, it's a great way to remind them that there's interesting content on your site. And there's been a lot of adoption. So 18 billion push notifications sent daily, which is a big number. Uh, I think this is exciting, but even more exciting. So we've seen over 50,000 domains using push notifications. This is really, really interesting uh, because it, it sort of speaks to the long tail um, aspects of the web. The web is really great at enabling the long tail of developers. And just to give one, one example, uh, this comes from Carnival Cruises. So on Carnival Cruise site, you can book, book a, um, a trip. You can put it on hold. Maybe you're not sure yet if you want to buy it. And then they'll, they'll offer a, a feature to notify you when your hold's about to expire. And they get about a 24% opt-in rate for this. And when the notification appears in front of users, 42% of them actually click on the notification and land back on the Carnival Cruise site. That's a big deal. Uh, these are users that they might not have had coming back otherwise. And um, slightly different topic, seamless sign-in. This is something you're going to hear more about later today. Um, this is about the Credential Manager API that we introduced around, back around Google I.O. But now we have some early partner results, and I want to share those with you. In the case of AliExpress, uh, they're seeing an 85% reduction in sign-in failures, which is really cool. And Pinterest seeing about a 10% increase in desktop logins. So these numbers are all about, these are early, early data, but people are seeing success. And the nice thing about the Credential Manager API, if, you don't, if you're not familiar with it, is that it's all about avoiding situations where users have to re-enter their, re their username and password because the browser already has that information, and we can negotiate a seamless way for, for it to 
it to uh, allow you to log in. And getting logged in and signed in is really important, especially for your engaging, uh, engaged users. And we're also going to talk a lot about payments, because we know this is a really important part of the web ecosystem. A lot of work's gone into improving payments on the web. We've, of course, put a lot of effort into autofill improvements in Chrome, but there's also the payment request API, which is all about making, bringing one tap payment to the web. Very excited about this. Zach will be up later talking about this. So I think, I think it's clear that building progressive web apps makes a lot of sense. There's a ton of value here. There's a lot of work going in to improve the platform and make it so that you can be really successful building progressive web apps. And we want to, we, I also want to take a moment to talk about some of the tools that we're building to help you be successful. And these are just some of the tools that I want to highlight. We're going to be talking about these throughout the conference and these tools and others. Uh, the first is Lighthouse. Uh, so this is a Chrome extension that we built that helps you um, zero in on some of the things you could do to improve your progressive web app. It's sort of a, an analysis tool. It helps you optimize your progressive web app. You'll hear more about this from Paul Irish a little bit later. And the second one is real-world condition testing, or simulating network and CPU conditions that you might find in the real world. This is a new feature of the dev tools in Chrome. Uh, it's very handy, um, very useful. Of course, there's no real substitute for real actual device testing. A lot of your users do not have fancy new Pixel phones and so on. Um, and so it's important to test with a diversity of, of phones uh, to make sure you're building an experience that works for everybody. And Alex will be up later talking about how to do that with, uh, again, with DevTools. There's also a new security and application panel in DevTools, which are really handy. You're going to hear more about these. But they're really uh, helpful to help to enable you to explore what's going on with your progressive web app. You know, being able to explore the cache is really a nice feature. And so the other tool I want to take a moment to talk about is Polymer. And we've been working on Polymer for a while now. This comes from the Chrome team. We built Polymer in the beginning because we, we, wanted to, uh, we wanted to do it in conjunction, in concert, with the improvements to the web platform. And Polymer is all about uh, web components. And web components are a new feature of the web platform. We wanted to develop web components the right way. And building Polymer was a way to sort of guide that process from, from our perspective. And Polymer is uh, a you know, great library. makes it really easy to build for the mobile web. And that's that's. That's important. We, again, we want to make it easy for everyone. But web components, of course, um, there's been quite an arc in the development of web components. Uh, the initial versions that we launched in Chrome, you know, they, weren't, they didn't see a lot of adoption from other browser vendors. That's unfortunate. But we went back to the drawing board, worked with them in the standards bodies. And today, I'm just pleased to announce that we're seeing a lot, a lot of uh, shared enthusiasm for these APIs. In fact, Apple has started shipping some of them like Shadow DOM v1. This is a big deal. If you're familiar with Polymer, Shadow DOM is the most complicated piece of the whole web components set of, of technologies. And getting this implemented natively means using web components can be done in a much more lightweight fashion. So it's great to see. And even on the tip of tree of WebKit now, custom elements v1 landed. And it's not behind a flag or anything. So it's fantastic to see all this progress. HTML imports will figure it out. <laughs> And there's a lot of partners uh, adopting Polymer, using it at scale, um, including many products from Google today, such as YouTube. Um, really, really excited to see all of this, uh, all these folks seeing success with Polymer. And at the Polymer Summit just a couple weeks back, a few weeks back, we announced Polymer version 2, which, in addition to being based on these new V1 specs of, of web components, also is a much lighter weight, faster uh, take on Polymer. Uh, we're really excited about it. You're going to hear a lot more about it later. In addition to Polymer being a library that helps you build web components, we've also uh, fleshed out the whole uh, Polymer a bit more with the Polymer app toolbox to make it easy for you to build applications. A lot of times, uh, uh, this is where folks are struggling. This makes it a lot easier to prototype and build experiences. And really happy to announce that there's been a lot of interest in the community around web components. We have this new site, beta.webcomponents.org, which you know, folks are just pouring in different uh, elements and, that they've built. So it's a great, great community site, great opportunity to kind of see what other folks are building and, and take advantage of these components. Again, the whole point with web components is these are reusable chunks of code and technology that you can use. So speaking of web components, I also want to talk about AMP. And AMP is another great tool for helping you get on the web. 
and be more successful in the web. And AMP is actually based on web components. Uh, it's got a custom markup, which are just web components. And there's over 700,000 domains now publishing AMP. So it's seeing a lot of adoption. And this is web components being used at scale. And AMP is, like I said, a great way to get content in front of users. And it can also be a great way to get content in users that leads, you, leads them into your PWA, leads them into your progressive web app. And we'll talk a lot more about using AMP and PWAs together tomorrow. So those are some of the tools. Also want to just make a few notes here about predictability. And what I mean by this is, you know, we want to make the web easier. Uh, a lot of times, you know, thanks to quite a lot of legacy, there's a lot of little uh, dark corners and so on and challenges for you as you're thinking about uh, targeting a bunch of different browsers. So this is a big focus for us. And our goal really is, like I said at the beginning, to move the whole web forward. And that includes uh, making, making it one platform as much as we can. And uh, so like I said, the web should just work, should just work for you. Uh, so we're focused on web standards. We're focusing on working with other browser vendors. These collaborations that we've had are really important. It leads to things, like I said, with web components and a service worker API and so on and so forth. And we're also working to sort of get better at doing uh, new feature incubation and figuring out how to like, work with the standards community to bring uh, features to, to market in a better way. So a lot of progress here. Our focus is, like I said, just on making things easier for you. And on that note, I just want to share a tool that we put together, which is this uh, browser bug searcher. It's just a, a convenient tool that lets you search bugs across all the different browser engines. I think it can be very handy. So check it out. And so also, on the education front, I uh, want to mention that there's been a lot of, um, so in addition to the Chrome Dev Summit, which, which you're at, <laughs> and we had a year ago, we also had the Progressive Web, Up, Web App Summit in the summer. And we've been having these progressive web app roadshows, which is taking content, uh, talking about web, web, progressive web apps and helping developers uh, be successful. So in fact, we just had one yesterday in San Francisco. Maybe some of you attended it. Uh, but this is content and code labs and scripts that you can take if, and use yourself to put on a progressive web app uh, event uh, in, case there's not, in case the roadshow isn't coming to your community. And we're also working on uh, longer instructor-led instructor pro, um, education programs on progressive web apps. So look for more of that to come. So looking ahead, I just want to wrap up a little bit by saying that, you know, obviously the web is a big deal. You're all here for a reason. We love the web, right? There's so much energy, so much innovation, so much enthusiasm, a lot of excitement. You can see how, the, how this path of just figuring out the mobile has gone and how we're, how we're accelerating towards you know, figuring out these wonderful progressive web app experiences that can make, make the experiences so much more delightful for users and help de developers be successful reaching those users. But there's a lot of other new technologies that I didn't mention that are coming to the web and enabling other really exciting opportunities. Think of, feature, uh, think of features like WebAssembly. There was just a cross-browser developer preview announced recently on this. WebAssembly is an evolution of asm.js, which was informed by some of the early work that we did on native client. WebAssembly combined with WebGL and now WebGL 2.0, bringing Open, OpenGL ES3 to the web. Imagine the kinds of experiences that this can enable, this technology can enable. Obviously, things like more immersive games, but a lot of other really cool stuff. I'm very excited about that. And then you combine some of those technologies and the things we're doing with, with new, new, new platforms like VR. Think about web VR and, and actually the kind of convenience that the web adds and the kind of capabilities it adds to VR. You're on your, you have your headset, you want to be able to like dig in on something and, and explore things. And if you have to stop to install apps, it's not going to work great. And so the web is actually a wonderful fit for such an environment. Think about AR, augmented reality. Here you're looking out onto the, into the real world, and, and this is future stuff. <laughs> Imagine something uh, tagging real objects in real space with, uh, with not just names and descriptions, but like URLs, so that you can go and find out more about that object. URL is such a powerful tool in that kind of world. And the web is such a great fit. And I think it's on us to kind of just explore and develop, and all of us, I mean, to figure out this kind of, figure out how the web can be leveraged in these kinds of environments. I'm very excited about the possibilities there. And then think about Internet of Things, IoT. Uh, you saw earlier the example of physical web to get access to URLs that are contextually relevant to you. 
But imagine you're walking up to some kind of device and it's broadcasting a URL to you and that URL is the, the application that you use to control that device. Thanks to APIs like Web Bluetooth, you can imagine how that would work, right? You walk up to some kind of a device and it uh, broadcasts a URL. Now you've got the control website and it's talking Web Bluetooth to that device and interacting with it. That seamlessness, that low frictionness of the web, it's such a great superpower. You can imagine it in so many other applications. So anyways, these are just some, some thoughts on that. And I'm excited to see what, what, what you all will build and what we'll build together. I'm excited to be part of this ecosystem. I think it's really exciting. Like I said, we have a lot of awesome content for you today and tomorrow. So thank you for being here. Thank you.